Mephistopheles or the spirit that always denies and the will to knowledge the master I have never despised your kind of all spirits that deny the rogue weighs least heavily on my mind Mephistopheles what executioner of course hands and feet and head and behind they are yours Since Lucian's appearance as cynical satirist who jeers at the cynical sect, one and a half millennia have passed. Through all the changes in world history, the decline of the Western Roman Empire, the Christianization of the Occident, the rise of feudalism, the age of chivalry, the Reformation, Renaissance, absolutism, the rise of the bourgeoisie, Mechanical impulses continued in the most varied refractions and disguises. Goethe's famous theatrical devil meets us at the zenith of the Enlightenment, and in the decade of the 18th century when the Sturm und Drang of the awakening bourgeois culture was at its most explosive. Mephistopheles appears in the stormy years of secularization that began to liquidate the thousand-year-old inheritance of Christianity. The essence of the bourgeois cultural revolution in the 18th century is characterised perhaps more than anything else by the fact that with the greatest poet of the age it embodies itself in the figure of a devil that, like Satan, enjoys the freedom to say things as they really are. The devil is the first post-Christian realist. His freedom to speak must still seem infernal to older contemporaries. When the devil opens his mouth to say how it really is in the world, the old Christian metaphysics, theology, feudal morality are swept away. If his horns and claws are also taken away, there remains of Mephistopheles, nothing more than a bourgeois philosopher, realist, anti-metaphysicist, empiricist, positivist. Not by chance did Faust, the epitome of the modern researcher from the 16th to the 19th centuries, seal a pact with a devil of this kind. Only from the devil can one learn how things really are. Only he has an interest in making us take off the religious spectacles and see with our very own eyes, in this way, the idea of God, the Father, Son and Company becomes superfluous. Mephistopheles is a fluorescent being who lives entirely in his metamorphoses. He emerges from a dog. For his first appearance the devil chooses the symbol of the cynical sect of philosophers. Recall that Faust, at the nadir of his theoretical despair, had decided to kill himself. The choirs of the Easter night hold him back from his intention at the very point when the ampule of poison is already touching his lips. He returns to life. On his Easter stroll he meditates on the dual nature of the soul. His thoughts on this can be read as the deep self-reflection of a bourgeois scientist. Within him there is a struggle between realism and insatiability. The drive towards life and the longing for death. The will to night and the will to power. The sense for what is possible and the drive towards what is still impossible. In the dusk Faust sees a black dog roaming through crop and stubble that circles around the strollers in broad spiral movements. Faust imagines that he sees an inferno behind the animal. Wagner, however, remains blind to the magical manifestation. In the end, a black poodle lies before the scholar on its belly, tail wagging, well trained, apparently tame. In the study, finally, the real metamorphosis of Satan begins, as the thinker is on the verge of translating the Evangelium of St. John into German. As soon as Faust has found the correct translation for the Greek concept Logos, tat, the dog starts yowling. Curious changes of form begin. 
or how long and broad my poodle is becoming. In the end, the travelling scholastic appears as the heart of the matter. Des poodles can. Literally, the poodle's kernel. Translator's note. And gradually reveals the devil's claws. The sequence of the scene graphically depicts the dialectic of master and servant. The devil cowers at first in the role of a dog, then of a servant, in order, so he thinks, to ultimately win complete domination over the scholar's soul. The metamorphosis from dog to monster, from monster to travelling scholastic, is only the beginning of a rather long series of transformations. Mephistopheles is like a master of disguise, an imposter or a spy, because the condition for the survival of evil in the post-Christian era is that it conceal itself behind the appropriate fashionable and socially accepted masks of innocuousness. The feudal personification of evil, as corporeal Satan is, so to speak, annulled in Goethe's ironic drama. The point of Goethe's theatrical devil, namely, in its, is its modernization to the worldly grand seigneur, a tendency continued by Thomas Mann in Dr. Faustus. The devil becomes the figure of imminence. The evil even gains sympathy through its civility. In Goethe's drama, even the witches have to look twice to see through the dissolute squire, Junker Liederlich. In one occasion, he appears as a worldly court figure with doublet and plume. On the next, in the student scene, he dons the costume of the great scholar in order to parody the scholar's learnedness in a satire inspired by a cynicism of knowledge. The most malicious improvisation of a gay science before nature. Finally, he appears as an elegant gentleman and magician who knows how to speak quick-wittedly with procuruses and is a fencing master. He instructs Faust on how he can expedite his lover's brother, who has become burdensome, into eternity. Impudent cheekiness and cold sarcasm belong inevitably to the attributes of the modern imminent devil. Just as much as cosmopolitanism, linguistic competence, cultivation and legal understanding, contracts have to be made in writing. This modernization of evil does not arise from a poet's whim, even though it is presented poetically ironically. It rests on a solid logical basis in the framework of modern forms of consciousness. Art is in no way merely the locus of the beautiful and the amusing, but one of the most important points of access for research into what is traditionally called truth. Truth in the sense of a perspective on the whole. Truth as understanding the essence of the world. Great art was always a pandem pandemonic art that tried to capture the theatre of the world. Great art was always a pandemonic art that tried to capture the theatre of the world. Herein is rooted the philosophical prominence of works of art such as Faust. At the point where traditional metaphysics fails in interpreting evil in the world, because the Christian background of these metaphysics with its optimism of salvation has faded, art jumps into the breach. Seen from the viewpoint of the history of ideas, Mephistopheles, whom I regard as a central figure of modern aesthetics, is a child of the idea of development, through which in the 18th century the age-old questions concerning the theodicy and the transience of phenomena can be posed in a new form, answered with a new logic. So much is certain that from this time on, evil in the world, death, destruction and negativities of all kinds, can no longer be interpreted as the punitive or testing interventions of God in human history, as was done by the centuries of Christianity. The secularization, naturalization and objectification of our understanding of the world has made too much progress for theological answers to still be able to satisfy. 
for more fully developed reason, these have become not only logically untenable, but what is more important, existentially implausible. God, devil, the entire theological nomenclature can at best be taken only symbolically. This is precisely what Goethe's drama attempts. It plays with the theological figures under poetic license. His irony seizes on a degenerated system of plausibility, only to use the old characters to erect a new logic, a new system of meaning. In substance, it is the same logic that underlies the Hegelian conception of the world and of history, the logic of evolution, the logic of a positive dialectic that promises constructive destruction. This thought model guarantees a new era of metaphysical speculation. It is borne by the powerful modern evidence that the world moves and that its movement is forward and upward. Suffering in the world appears from this perspective as the necessary price for development, which leads inexorably from the dark beginnings towards radiant goals. Enlightenment is not merely a theory of light, but still more a theory of the movement toward light. Optics, dynamics, organology, theory of evolution. Goethe's devil already practices this new way of seeing that, as we will show, constitutes a foundation of all great modern theories that are at least tempted by cynicism. In evolutionism lies the logical root of theorising cynicisms that cast grand rulers' gazes on reality. In the sciences, theories of evolution take over the metaphysical inheritance. Only they possess enough logical power to integrate with a comprehensive view the evil, degeneration, death, pain, the whole gamut of negativities inflicted on the living. Those who say development and affirm the goals of development have found a perspective that can justify whatever serves development. Evolution, progress, is thus the modern theodicy. It provides the final logical underpinnings for the negative. In the evolutionist's view of what must suffer and perish, modern intellectual cynicism already plays its ineluctable game. For it, the dead are the manure of the future. The death of others appears as the ontological and logical premise for the success of one's own cause. In an incomparable manner, Goethe has the devil express the metaphysically permeated confidence in life of the newly conceived dialectic. Faust. Very well, who are you then? Mephistopheles. A part of the force that always wills evil and always creates good. Faust. What is meant by this riddle? Mephistopheles. I am the spirit that constantly denies, and that rightly so, for everything which arises is worthy of perishing. Therefore it would be better if nothing arose. Thus everything which you call sin, destruction, in short evil, is my proper element. As far as the history of the chemical impulse is concerned, whose tracks we are following, Mephistopheles occupies an ambiguous position within it. With his grand seigneur side, such as with his proclivity, proclivity for grand theory, he is a cynic. With his plebeian, realistic and sensuously joyful side, he is cynically oriented. One of the paradoxes of this worldly and ordinary devil of evolution who can also imitate Eulenspiegel, is that in relation to Dr. Faust, he is the real enlightener. The scholar possesses a series of traits that today would be readily designated as anti-enlightenment. The esoteric urge to communicate with the spirits beyond, interests in magic, and a questionable taste for crossing the limits of human reason and demanding too much of it. The person who is not satisfied with the deficient rationalism and empiricism of human knowledge will really say in the end, Here I stand, a fool so poor, I am as wise as I was before. At the end of the great will to knowledge, there is of necessity always theoretical despair. 
the thinker's heart burns when he realises that we cannot know what we really want to know. Faust is basically a desperate Kantian who tries to escape the compulsion to self-limitation through a magical back door. The urge go beyond the limit. The urge to go beyond the limit remains stronger than the insight into the limitedness of our knowledge. In Faust we can already see what Nietzsche and later pragmatism will emphasise. That the will to knowledge is always nourished by a will to power. For this reason the will to knowledge can never come to rest in knowledge itself. Its urge, according to its roots, is measurable because behind every knowledge new puzzles mount up. A priori, knowledge wants to know more. What one does not know, that is precisely what is needed, and what one knows cannot be used. Wanting to know is an offspring of the desire for power, the striving for expansion, existence, sexuality, pleasure, enjoyment of the self, and for anaesthetizing the necessity of dying. Whatever, present, <clears throat> whatever presents itself as theoretical enlightenment and research in the nature of things can never reach its alleged goals because these do not belong to the theoretical sphere. For those who realise this, the scientific impulse becomes an aesthetic impulse. Art is the real gay science. It stands as the last guarantor of a sovereign and realistic consciousness between religion and science. However, it does not have to, like the former, appeal to faith, but has experience and the vitality of the senses on its side. On the other hand, it does not have to treat the empirically given in such a rigorously truncating way as the latter. The devil, who, in Goethe's work, guarantees the principle of morally unrestricted experience, entices the despairing enlightener into the broad field of life. So that you, without bonds, free, experience what life is. What has been called the amoralism of art, to be allowed to see and say everything, is really only the obverse side of this new total empiricism. Those who have experienced the despair of the impossible, will to knowledge, can become free for the adventure of conscious living. Experience will never be entirely absorbed by theory, as presupposed by consistent rationalists. Experience what life is. The principle of experience in the last analysis bursts all moralism, including that of the scientific method. What life is, is grasped by the researcher not in the theoretical attitude, but solely through the leap into life itself. Mephistopheles serves those who want to take the step beyond theory as magister ludi. He introduces them to the process of a cynical and cynical empiricism from which alone life experience arises. Come what may, whether morally good or evil, that is no longer the question. Scientists who hide their will to power from themselves and conceive of experience only as knowledge about objects cannot achieve that knowledge acquired by accumulating experience in the form of a journey to the real things. For the empirical amoralist, life is not an object, but a medium. A journey, a practical essay, a project of alert existence. As soon as they consciously experience their entanglement in the fate of other lives, chemical empiricists inevitably encounter what is commonly called evil. However, they experience, in so-called evil, an unavoidable side that puts them right in the middle and above it at the same time. Evil appears to them as something that, by its very nature, cannot be anything other than what it is. The prototype of this evil, which is stronger than morality, which demands only that the former ought not to be, are free sexuality, aggression and unconsciousness, insofar as the last is to blame for fateful entanglements. Compare the model tragedy of unconscious action, Oedipus Rex.
the greatest of all moral shamelessness and simultaneously the most unavoidable of all is to be a survivor. Over shorter or longer causal chains, every living person is a survivor. Überlebene, literally over liver, translators note, whose acts and omissions are connected to the downfall of others. Where such causal chains remain short and direct, one speaks of guilt. Where they are more mediated, of guiltless guilt or tragedy. Where they are strongly mediated, indirect and universal, of bad conscience, uneasiness, tragic feeling towards life. Faust too does not escape this experience, for he becomes not only the seducer and lover of Gretchen, but also the one who survives her. Pregnant by him, she murders the child of this love and despair. For her, out of good has come evil, out of sexual surrender, social scandal. The causality of fate which arises from the mechanism of morality rolls over her with merciless consistency. Despair, confusion, murder, execution. The tragedy can be read as a passionate poetical plea for the widening of moral consciousness. Art is critique of naive, mechanical, reactive consciousness. Under the presupposition of naivete, disastrous consequences must follow repeatedly from the feelings, morals, identifications and passions of human beings. Only in naivety and unconsciousness can mechanical moral causality make its game of the individuals. But in contrast to Gretchen, who was destroyed by the tragic mechanisms, Faust has a master teacher at his side, who keeps him out of the possible causalities of blind, naive despair. But you are otherwise rather bedeviled. I find nothing in the world more absurd than a devil who despairs. In vain, Faust imprecates his, cre his teacher, who inflicts on him the pain of experiencing himself as an accomplice devil. He would gladly banish the devil back into the shape of the cynical dog, or still further into that of the snake. But all paths back to naivety are closed to him. He has gained the Mephistophelian consciousness for himself, which demands that whatever human beings can know about themselves, they should in fact know. It breaks the spell of the unconscious. The aesthetic amoralism of great art implies a school of becoming conscious. Morality works on in naive consciousness like a part of the unconscious. What is unconscious, mechanical, unfree in our behaviour? This is the real evil. Mephisto, as we said, possesses the profile of a cynical enlightener, and thus displays a knowledge gained only by those who have risked having a perspective on things that is free of morality. This is shown nowhere better than with sexuality, where emphatically moral inhibitions must first be left behind in order, like Faust, without bonds, free to experience what life is. Mephisto is the first sexual positivist in our literature. His way of seeing is already that of sexual kinicism. It is true a child is a child and play is play. For him it is no secret how the clockwork and the man, Faust, can be wound up. Only the vision of the naked woman within him has to be awakened, in modern language the erotic illusion, the imago, the sought-after ideal. The sexual schema. The elixir of youth awakens the drive that makes every woman as desirable as Helen. The person who falls in love, as suggested by Goethe's irony, is basically the victim of a chemical reaction. More modern cynics or playboys assure us that love is nothing more than a hormonal disturbance. The cynical bite lies in the nothing more, which literarily belongs to satire. Existentially, to nihilism, epistemologically to reductionism, metaphysically to vulgar materialism. 
as serene materialist, Mephistopheles prof professes the animal compulsiveness of love. Custom or not, it passes too. Whatever may occur to love-smitten fools by way of elevated gushing does not count. Insofar as one insofar as one as proper Diabolus always thinks only of one thing, what chaste hearts cannot do without. The attitude of the critical devil towards the sciences is scarcely less lacking in respect. The entire lifeless, logically ossified, conceptual casuistry of learned stuff does not suit him. If empiricism is his program, then in mechanical, vital form, head over heels into a full life, let one's own experience be the ultimate criterion. His speech encourages one to risk experience, and because he is distinguished because he distinguishes sharply between the grey of theory and the green of life, he finds none of the academic forms of teaching to his taste. Professors are the fools of their own doctrinal structures, in modern language accessories to their discourses. In all faculties, vain babblers hang around who complicate the simplest things to the point of unrecognisability. The jurists no, no less than the philosophers, the theologians by profession, and the medicos with a vengeance. As a cynical gynaecologist, Mephisto relates the pernicious old proverb that all female diseases are to be cured from one point. Our theory devil can, of course, expect more applause when he brings his semantic cynicism today, language critique, into play against the pseudologies and arrogated terminologies of the disciplines. He sees that incomprehension likes to take refuge in words, and that ignorance can keep itself afloat longest by having command of a jargon. The devil expresses what students feel, that doctoral stupidity, quoting Flaubert, is part and parcel of the university, which, safe from discovery, smugly reproduces itself there. What this devil presents in the Collegium Logicum, students seen, on the subject of the language of philosophers and theologians amounts to a poetical nominalism that stands up to the most rigorous logical reconstruction. If one takes stock, one recognises that Goethe's Mephistopheles, in spite of all symbolic concessions, is basically already no longer a Christian devil, but a post-Christian figure with pre-Christian traits. The modern side in him touches on a re-actualised antiquity, dialectic evolutionism, positive destruction, evil that is good, touches on a philosophical conception of nature that has more to do with Thales of Miletus and Heraclitus than with Kant and Newton.